Thank you, Rose. She's not going by the name Rose anymore. She's taken the name the Miller family. You know, most people simplify. You know, they say Cher or Prince or something like that. But Rose took three names now. Thank you, the Miller family. Ariel uh, stepped on something and had to have surgery. She was supposed to sing this morning, the whole Miller family. So I hope Ariel is doing better. And she'll be back with us soon. Have you ever noticed that uh, as things age, they tend to lose their flexibility? (laughs) As things get older, they tend to get hard and stiff and rigid. I'm thinking of stuff like made of rubber, uh, uh, tires and gaskets, uh, bushings, seals, the kind of seals that go around windows, not the kind that swim in the ocean, you know. Although they may get stiff as they age, too. I, they don't talk about it much. <laughs> um, plastics, vinyls, the vinyl siding, if you have it on your house. On this church building, on this building, when it was new, you could bend it. It would bend, take a piece, and you could bend it. But now, if you went out there and took a piece off, it would just snap in half. Paper, wood, leather, even cloth, to some degree. The, the older things get, the less flexible they are. And so when you try to, to manipulate them, they, they just crack and, and they can fall apart much more easily. Things tend to become rigid as they age. Uh, and frankly, you know, so do people. Um, many people, many, maybe most people are like that. It almost always happens to some degree physically, and that's what you were laughing about. Um, you who are living it, as we age, we can't bend or move or stretch quite like we once could. Uh, When we're up, it can be hard to sit down. (laughs) And when we're down, it can be hard to stand up. Um, But there can also come with age a stiffness and a rigidity of the mind and of the attitude, of the will. Uh, People get set in their ways and they become inflexible. They won't bend. They won't open themselves to new things or new ideas or new perspectives. And that's another sort of rigidity, isn't it? Now, of course, there are some people who assume that just because something is new, then it must be better. And people like that will jump on any bandwagon that comes by without even really thinking about it. You know, they're so open-minded that their brains fall out. And, (laughs) of course, that's not good and that's not healthy. Uh, It's not a good way to look at things. But usually the greater danger of age is the tendency toward inflexibility and rigidity. Since those things, uh, inflexibility, rigidity, they can keep a person stuck in the past and preclude us from participating in any new, truly good thing that even God is doing. That was the case with the Pharisees, and especially the scribes the teachers of the law, in Jesus' day. Uh, Now, on the whole, the the scribes were the more physically aged of the two groups. But, of course, rigidity is not always just a function of age, is it? Uh, Rigidity, inflexibility, is also a function of the will. Is a person willing to see things differently? Is, Is a person willing to broaden their perspective? Are you willing to consider the fact that your opinion may not constitute the last word? Certainly, there is an element of will involved in all that. Now, again, I am not talking about anything goes brain falling out open mindedness here. That's not what I'm saying. I don't mean any of this in the context either of the essentials of the faith. Not at all. But. In other matters, are we inflexible of will? Are we stiff of perspective? Have we turned far too many things into essentials? According to Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees of his day had done just that. They had turned a whole raft of non-essentials into essentials. And in those things, 
It was their way or the highway. And here in this text, we get a great example. So if you haven't already, turn back there in a Bible. Would you? There are, there are some Bibles in the seats. If you have one uh, or if you need one, grab one there. Turn back to Luke chapter 7. Let me tell you, it's good to have the text in front of you. Because if the sermon gets boring, you can at least have something to read. It's just a very good practice. So, Luke begins with a summary of the situation in chapter 7, verse 29 there, where he says, all the people, even the tax collectors, he notes, when they heard Jesus' words, they acknowledged that God's way was right because they'd been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law, otherwise known as scribes, rejected, and this is how Luke puts it, God's purpose for themselves. For those crowds who had heard John the Baptist and who were now hearing Jesus. You see, the pieces were beginning to kind of come together for them. What John had said and done out there in the wilderness and what Jesus was saying and doing there in the villages, it was beginning to to make sense to them. They were coming along. They were open to, as Luke puts it here, God's purposes. But the religious leaders... (laughs) The ones who were educated and trained in all of this. The ones who were supposed to be Israel's spiritual guides. They were not open to what John and Jesus said and did. They were not open at all. Why? Why not? I guess is the question. Because it was not what they thought it should be. They were simply not open to changing their minds. And so Jesus describes them with a little parable. He says, in effect, that they're childish. Those who reject him and his message, and also John and his message, Jesus says, are like immature children complaining to their friends about their other friends, whining that no one was doing what was expected, what was right in their eyes to do. Think back to when you were a kid. You get into a group to play some game. And there would almost always be at least one in the group who became the rules Nazi. You know? They were the authority on the rules. And everybody had to play the game their way. And if you weren't playing the game their way, the way they wanted, then they'd start complaining. And they'd start whining. Well, this isn't right. This isn't fair. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. You fouled me. You're cheating. And if everyone didn't give in to their way, they'd walk off with their arms folded and they'd go sulk in a corner somewhere, you know. You remember that happening? You remember that kid? Were you that kid? (laughs) The kid who got mad, took your toys, went home. When things didn't go as you expect. That's the image here. That's the image of the parable. The scribes and the Pharisees were complaining because the game wasn't being played according to their rules. According to their expectations. And they were trying to lead the people along that path. Because they thought their expectations were right. They thought their expectations had to be right. You see, rigid. Stiff. Inflexible. Look at what Jesus says in verse 33 there. The scribes and the Pharisees, they complained about John and his crazy preaching out in the wilderness. I mean, what was he doing out there? You know, that was just wacko to them. He wore weird clothes. He he wouldn't drink. He wouldn't eat what normal people ate. And his preaching, (laughs) he was what we would call fire and brimstone. You know, John the Baptist makes Jonathan Edwards look like Joel Osteen. And, and the scribes didn't like that. They just didn't like it. I mean, to them, John was, he was way too serious. You know, he was way too caustic. He was too political. He talked about the king. He was too bossy and too austere. He was nowhere near what they expected. And frankly, he was not what they wanted. So they said he was demon-possessed. And yet... The very same ones who complained about John also complained about Jesus, who was doing, in many ways, just the opposite of what John was doing. 
You know, Jesus was friendly. He was approachable. He talked with Gentiles and with women and with Gentile women. He not only ate normal things, but he ate normal things in the homes of normal people and all sorts of different people, even people who the scribes and Pharisees considered sinners. Jesus apparently drank. He was friends with ungodly people. He hung around them, and they hung around him, and they liked him. But the religious leaders didn't like that either. So they called him a glutton. And a drunk, a friend of people whom proper Jewish society despised and shunned. And they concluded that Jesus, too, was demon-possessed. That strategy has been around for centuries. And still with us today, isn't it? If you can't beat someone with logic or reason, then just call them a name. Yeah, it proves not one thing, but it makes you feel better. <laughs> Actually, that is the strategy that a lot of rigid, inflexible people choose. If someone doesn't like something that they, you know, they don't like it, and somebody does it, then they call them a name. Liberal, heretic, hypocrite. Now, again, don't get me wrong, there absolutely are such things as liberals and heretics and hypocrites where the gospel of Christ is concerned. Absolutely. There are people who absolutely deserve those labels. But these are the sorts of names that the scribes and Pharisees called Jesus himself, you see. And they called him these things because he was breaking their boundaries. He was not breaking the boundaries of God's law or God's standards or God's morals. No, but Jesus was breaking the scribes and the Pharisees' boundaries and standards and mores. He broke the borders and the fences that the scribes had erected through the decades around things. He wasn't meeting their expectations of, of Messiah, which had become completely rigid and inflexible, let's say with age, <laughs> through the years. You know, I think that Jesus was even breaking the boundaries that John the Baptist had in mind for the Messiah. Or he wouldn't, John wouldn't have sent people to ask Jesus, hey, are you really the one? You see, even the best of people can have these boundary blind spots that make them rigid over time. So how did Jesus break boundaries? Well, generally speaking, Jesus always said no to people pleasing. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't participate in it. He never played up to the crowds. He never told people what they wanted to hear just because they wanted to hear it. He did not come to seek people's approval. So he just wasn't concerned about people's expectations. There's freedom in that. It's not that he was some James Dean, you know, rebel without a cause. Kind of guy. On the contrary, Jesus was a rebel with a cause. And his cause was simply to do what God wanted him to do. And God wanted him to reach people and, and tell people the possibility and the good news of redemption. And sometimes doing that broke human imposed boundaries. Sometimes the boundaries Jesus broke were religious in, in nature. Like when he, he came in and he cleared the temple of all the money changers who were dishonoring God with their practices. Uh, or when he told Nicodemus, who was a big kahuna Pharisee, you know, he, he said, hey, don't think you're on your way to heaven, Nicodemus. Despite what you believe, you're still a sinner who must be born again. He said that to Nicodemus. He did. Or when he broke Levitical protocol to heal a crippled man on the Sabbath. And that's only the beginning. You know, I mean, you can look through the Gospels. You can find instance after instance after instance of Jesus breaking the religious boundaries. But religious boundaries weren't the only one Jesus broke. In his determination to do God's will, Jesus also broke ethnic boundaries and economic boundaries. Socioeconomic boundaries. To the shock of the Jews, Jesus healed both the child of a Syrian woman 
and the servant of a Roman centurion. He engaged positively with the Gentiles who came to him in faith. He ate with tax collectors whom the religious elite called the dregs of society. You know, he befriended wealthy Zacchaeus, but he also commended that impoverished widow who had slipped two coins into the offering plate. Jesus looked past rich and poor. He looked past Jew, Gentile. He looked past those who were accepted and those who were outcasts. Since he knew that all of them were sinners in need of a savior. They all fell into his basket in one way or another. Jesus also broke age boundaries. He engaged with both the young and the old. He honored the elders and he loved the children. He broke gender barriers. In in this highly patriarchal society in which he lived, even though he did choose 12 men as his disciples, he welcomed women to serve with him in ministry, many of whom actually did what the men didn't. They stayed faithful to him until the very end. Jesus looked past gender because, again, he knew that both male and female were sinners in need of a savior. Jesus broke health barriers, getting near and and even touching those who were considered unclean, both men and women. Everyone else avoided those people out of fear, but Jesus loved them and he had compassion on them. Those who suffered in body and mind the effects of life in a fallen world. He had compassion on them. And then maybe most importantly, Jesus broke the sin barrier. Uh, the reason for all the other barriers. Uh, in Mark 2, when, when Jesus healed the paralytic, he also said to him, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And you remember some of the scribes were sitting there and they questioned in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Jesus made him furious. But he was willing to be misunderstood at best and rejected at worst so that he could complete the mission that God had given him where other people backed away Jesus charged forward he spoke truth no matter what other people thought he knew when to speak and when to be quiet but he never took a pole to test the waters you know I wonder what people think if I say this he never favored one group above another because he all he knew that they all needed God's truth spoken to them in love Jesus never minimized people's sin, but neither did he ever maximize people's place or power in society. He didn't try to please the rich. He didn't placate the religious. He refused to overlook the poor and the downtrodden. Jesus was a people lover, but not a people pleaser. And there's a big difference between the two. He didn't worry about what the scribes, he didn't worry about what the Pharisees might say. Because he cared more about people's hearts than he cared about the optics of the situation. He took their criticisms because he didn't care about the approval of the human boundary setters. Only his heavenly father's approval mattered to him. He had this healthy habit of breaking those boundaries that that came into conflict with God's will and God's purposes. And um, that is a healthy habit that he'd like his followers to learn. How do we do that? How do we follow Jesus in his habit of breaking boundaries? Well, like the others we've talked about, we follow the guidance of his word and his spirit. We don't break boundaries just for the sake of being edgy or appearing rebellious or or making a name for ourselves or feeding our egos. You know, some people are motivated by those things, and that's simply not Christ-like. So check your motive. Check your motive first. Uh, A better way to start uh, breaking boundaries is to ask ourselves some pretty hard and maybe revealing questions. Like... What people are we seeking to please by following human traditions and preferences 
even in our spiritual lives, instead of doing what God is clearly calling us to do? What people are we seeking to please? Now, it's not that traditions are automatically bad, not at all. But they are when they become boundaries that keep us from accomplishing God's will in our lives. Another question to ask ourselves might be, where are we prejudiced against those from different ethnic or socioeconomic backgrounds? Is there any prejudice within us? What goes through our minds when we meet someone who is very different than us? Do we intentionally try to befriend people unlike us for the sake of the gospel? Or do we avoid them? Do we kind of stay away from them? Do we assume a whole bunch of stuff about them? In our hearts, do we despise or do we neglect those who seem either too young or too old for our company? Do we disregard or do we withhold respect from people based on age? Let me tell you, that's a lot more common than you might think. Jesus didn't do that. Do we honor the equal value and worth of both genders? Or is there chauvinism or bigotry hiding within us somewhere? Do we avoid or fear the disabled or or chronically ill? Do we try to avoid them because we know that engaging with them might cost us something? It might cost us some time or energy or compassion. These are all boundaries that Jesus broke in his life. And he calls his people to break them too. That's part of what following Jesus means. So if, uh, if some of these boundaries need broken in your life, in my life, if the Spirit is speaking about a boundary that needs broken, let me say, first of all, give thanks because this is discipleship. <laughs> uh, this is becoming more like Jesus. Uh, and then second, just, just say, yeah, yes. Say yes to whatever boundary God is calling you to, to break for the sake of doing his will, for the sake of, of becoming more like Jesus, his son. Break the boundary and, and then move forward with his presence and, and with his blessing. Jesus, what... What boundary did you break that you're asking somebody here to break today? Um, To make a habit in our lives in order to follow you. Um, Holy Spirit, would you reveal that? Uh, And answer, answer some of these questions in, in our hearts. Does it have to do with pleasing people too much? Is it, is it religious in, in nature? Some rule that somebody made that has Really, no real basis even in scripture. (laughs) What boundary is it? Is it social? Is it ethnic? Is it economic? Does it have to do with age or gender or health? Do we avoid the very people we should be running toward with the message of forgiveness? Lord, whatever it is in our lives, would you help us to follow you in the habit of breaking boundaries for no other reason than to become more like you and to show more people who you really are, who you really are. Let that be our motivation, our only motivation. And let us develop this healthy habit that you exhibited all your life and all your ministry. In your name we pray. Amen.